Welcome to Soli Luna Inspirations with myself, Diana Robinson, and Martin Comtois. Boop, boop, boop. Today, we're excited to talk about the winter solstice and the coming up next month, 2022. It's going to be on Wednesday, December 21st at 1.48 p.m. And Martin has coined it as the healing of the mothers. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us again. I um, want to remind you to subscribe and share and comment and ask questions. Uh, we are so grateful for you guys to all tune in. Uh, we got a great show for you today. How you been feeling this, um, what I call the, um, the Scorpio eclipse season hangover? How's that going for you? Better than last week. Yeah, bit by bit, integrating more and more. And the more I integrate, the easier the hangover subsides. <laughs> How the, about you? <laughs> last week, we talked about the the the, the coming tomorrow's um, um, mm -hmm. Sagittarius new moon and how the sun has just moved into Sagittarius and how Sagittarius is about getting to understand um, what went through Scorpio, you know, we experienced this death and rebirth. And so then this quest for meaning is so important. So the, the, the winter solstice comes at the end of, um, of the Sagittarius season. And so here we are. Yeah, we're going to get the file up. So the winter solstice is called the solar ingress into Capricorn. So the sun, if you look at the chart, the sun is entering into Capricorn. It's at zero degree of Capricorn. And so we're doing a horary chart. So in the past, uh, Mark, Ed Mark Edmund Jones, an, astrology, an astrologer of the 20s and the 30s, used to do equinox and solstice charts to predict um, the upcoming season. So we're doing a horary chart um, as an oracle. Oracle means we want to get insight into the spirit of the times. What do we expect from next season? What do we expect from this fall, uh, uh, this coming winter? And so that's what we're going to look at the chart from. The first thing we need to look at when we do that is we need to look at the ruler uh, uh, rulership of the chart. Do you remember how to do that, uh, Diana? Yeah, I believe you called it the final dispositor before, too. Okay, so find the final dispositor of the chart. Okay, so <laughs> if you start with the ascendant, can I start with the ascendant? Please. Okay, so then if the ascendant starts in Taurus... Taurus is ruled by Venus. Venus is in Capricorn. Capricorn's ruled by Saturn. That's right. Saturn's in Aquarius. So then Saturn is in Aquarius. So then that sat so Saturn ends there, right? Right. Okay. So now I'll go to the next planet. So then Mars is in Gemini. Gemini is ruled by Mercury. Mercury is also in Capricorn. Capricorn again is ruled by Saturn. Saturn's in Aquarius. Okay. okay. Go to the next planet. So then the moon. Moon is in Sagittarius. Sagittarius is ruled by Jupiter. Jupiter is just coming into Aries. Aries is ruled by Mars. Mars is ruled by Gemini. And Gemini is ruled by... Sorry, mm. Mars not ruled by Gemini. Mars is in Gemini. And Gemini is ruled by Mercury. Mercury is in Capricorn right now. And again, that comes back to Saturn. And then, and then all the other planets are in Capricorn sign, all yeah. ruled by Saturn. And then Neptune is in Pisces, ruled by Jupiter, ruled by Mars, ruled by Mercury, ruled by Saturn. So Saturn disposits all the planets. So what does that mean for us, Saturn dispositing all the planets? So while well, you were looking at that in the ephemeris there, that uh, Saturn has oh, been yeah. in Capricorn and in Pisces and in, in, in Aquarius for the last five years, both of those signs, Capricorn and Aquarius, are ruled by Saturn. So that means that in all likelihood, most of the charts that you pulled over the last five years, Saturn's been very strong, or Saturn's been the ruler of the chart outright. And so then we've been going through a very Saturnian time. And so what, what is a Saturn in Aquarius? You know, Saturn in Capricorn 
it's about mastering structure. Uh, but uh, I was just reading in um, in uh, Liz Green's book on Saturn, Saturn, an old look, a new look and an old devil, yeah. a fabulous book. And then wherever Saturn is, that particular sign in that particular house are very difficult for the individual to integrate. Mm-hmm. So Saturn in Capricorn is about the mastery of the material world and Saturn in Capricorn really has to struggle to get that done. Now Saturn in Aquarius has a different flavor altogether, but it's still very Saturnian, but it's a Saturn in air sign. In an air sign, Aquarius is about the ideal of community. Mm-hmm. So then Saturn in Aquarius It's a very lonely placement because one has to struggle so hard to find community and then all constantly becomes disillusion, you know? So then then this, this, uh, this quest or this real need for community that we all have uh, um, through these times and how it's been denied to us. So that Saturn in Aquarius, and even though a lot of them, you know, mandates and a lot of difficulties in 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 that we've been overcoming are gone still there's quite a separation you know quite a, a big need for bridging the gap in the community you know finding my place in community mm-hmm. and that's the the um the polarity of leo and aquarius leo is the individual aquarius is uh, the community and so leo without a community is very lonely and a community that doesn't respect the individual is is a tyranny you know so then we're, here we are really you know getting an understanding of that and so one of the first things that you see in that chart is that saturn is getting ready to move out of aquarius into um Pisces. Into Pisces. And that's going to be a very significant. So at the end of Saturn, in its own signs, when it moves into Pisces on March 2023. But uh, so that's the main, so that's the rulership of Saturn. So whenever you read a, a chart in a horary manner, the moon is uh, where you start. Um, and the reason for that is that the ancients, the order of the planets was much different than our order of planet. Now we we look at Sun, uh, and then Mercury. Uh, no, how, how did that go? So I do it solar based. So is it like Sun, Mars, Venus, Mercury, Earth? No, Mars. Is well, we look at sun. <laughs> we look at sun, moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars. Yeah. So in the ancient, they looked at moon, Mercury, Venus, and then sun, and then Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. It's a very Earth based. Well, it was you know because the the system is geocentric. Yeah. Right. So then everything started with the moon. So then when we look at this moon, we see a moon in the seventh house in Sagittarius. So moon in seventh house in Sagittarius, what does that say to you? Moon in seventh house um, and Sag. I think of the moon as like uh, our inner world and our home. And then the seventh house, our relationships and how we connect. And then Sagittarius, this quest for meaning and often can be like very intuitive or playful. Um yeah, what would you say about the moon in seventh well, house? Well, that's exactly what I would say about that moon in seventh house. Now, that moon in seventh house is in direct opposition to Mars mm-hmm. retrograde in Gemini. Mm-hmm. So let's flesh that out for a while. So Mars in Gemini in the first house moving retrograde. So Mars is my will, my my, the planet, the hero, the planet of the hero, the archetype of the hero, you know, how I manifest my will into the cosmos. In Gemini, it's an air sign concerned with ideas and information and gathering information. Mm-hmm. 
moving retrograde. So that gathering of information looks backward. It looks into gathering the information that I have forgotten in opposition to the moon and Sagittarius who seeks meaning. And that Mars is in the first house. So it's very, you know, very clear that we are looking for answers, you know, mm -hmm. this Mars um, a retrograde in Gemini, it's like, okay, where's the information that I need? Now that moon, that moon Mars opposition, you want to put the, the chart back on? Sure. The moon Mars opposition is also in, um, angle to Chiron. So Chiron makes a trine and Mars makes a trine, but also Jupiter makes a trine to the moon. So the moon is rule is in Sagittarius ruled by Jupiter. So then there's a very optimistic quest for knowledge. A very, you know, this, this, the great sage, Jupiter, the moon in Sagittarius, we want to know Chiron is the wounded healer, hmm. you know, so it's the, it's the wounds of the ancestors. So our healing comes from gathering information so we can relate to others. Exactly. And with Jupiter, hmm. we're very enthusiastic about that. And that sets the tone for the coming of the year because, you know, the first quarter of the year there in, Mar in March, you know, we'll have two really important, you know, we'll have Mars coming in, I mean, Saturn coming into Pisces, but we'll also have the Jupiter Chiron conjunction, which, you know, in the sign of the warrior, Mars, you know, so while Mars is traveling through Gemini, we, uh, you know, it's ruling that Jupiter Chiron. And so that's why I arrived at that title of the healing of the mothers, you know, mm -hmm. we get our body from the mothers, you know, and really spiritually, you know, one of the great difficulties of our times is our dissociation with roots, with spirit, with the mothers, you know, when we talk about the mothers, we can talk about our personal mother, but we can look at those who nurture us and we can look at mother earth and we can look at uh, the great mother, and, and we can also look at the ancestral mother. Mm -hmm. And so there's a wounding of the ancestral mother and really at the root cause of our problem is this dissociation with the spirit of the mothers. And so then I think that more and more as we move into out of the Saturn Uranus, a square and out of the Saturn Uranus time and out of the Saturnian time into the more mystical waters of Pisces when when Saturn comes into um, 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 Pisces, then the discipline of the mystical discipline of healing our connection with the mothers, I think is going to become really, really important. So I love that. It's interesting to me how much ancestors have been coming up for people. It's like this main thread in conversations around me lately is how many people are talking about their ancestors, whether they have related to them or not related to them. There's this big calling of awareness, and I feel like that ties in so interestingly. Well, I, I personally think that uh, this crisis that we've just been through is the ancestors rising up and saying, okay, unless you reconnect with us and heal us, you're not going to be able to move forward as a society. Mm -hmm. And even though we look at this collective psychosis in terms of, you know, a crisis in health and or a crisis in sociocultural establishment, really, it is a spiritual uh, crisis. And it's about healing of the mothers. That's how I look at it. That makes a lot of sense. So then, then we go into studying. So we looked at the constellation of Moon, Chiron, Mars, and Jupiter. Now we'll look at the solar constellation. 
The sun makes a sextile to Pluto in the tenth in Capricorn and makes a square to the Jupiter-Neptune conjunction. Jupiter's just leaving Pisces. Uh, so um, just a day. Zero degrees. <laughs> well, so Jupiter is ingressing into Aries and leaving Gemini, I mean, leaving Pisces, and that Jupiter-Neptune conjunction was one of the main events of 2022, you know, a real awakening, you know, Neptune and Pisces, the quest for redemption, Jupiter-Neptune conjunction in Pisces is the, the need to... Um, to the, for the great sage to show up for the redemption of uh, of the soul, right? So the you know the so that's a big flavor, and then so we have sun. That was in April this year, hey. Yeah, yeah. Cool. And then it came really close. It's like really close right now. It's the closest it's going to be right now at this particular new moon that we're at. But the Jupiter Neptune, the quest for redemption makes angle to Pluto in Capricorn and then to the sun. So Capricorn, Pluto in the 10th house, this is our calling, right? The 10th house is what we're here to do in the world. Mm -hmm. Pluto is the ancestral rage of the great mother. So, and then Jupiter, Neptune is the quest for redemption and the sun you know, what it is that we hear to shine in the world is about this redemption of the ancestral rage. So they say in the chart, you know, the patterns repeat themselves so you can't miss the pat the, yeah. the message, you know. So the lunar complex talks about Chiron and Mars and Jupiter, and then the solar complex uh, talks about Pluto, uh, Jupiter, and Neptune. You got any questions about that? No, I guess I'm just trying to like digest it a bit. So if the sun is in, the sun is moving into Capricorn this day, that's what makes it an eclipse. And then we have it in- Not eclipse. Sorry, the, the equinox. The, the, the solstice, solstice. Yes. Winter solstice. Um. Then, so if the solstice marks that, then sun is square Jupiter, degree, Neptune. Jupiter, Neptune, there's this like- I guess, how would you say that? I'd say like, oh, so the solar archetype, our father, our spirit in square. So not in harmony per se with our yearning to expand and universal love. How would you say that? Well, the, the you know, one has to transcend this need to want to make this, you know, an aspect good or bad one wants one has to look at what the aspect is saying mm -hmm. so traditionally a square is challenging but here you have the solar archetype in square to jupiter neptune in conjunction which is a really emancipating and beautiful you know almost mystical spiritual full of beauty and transcendence and poetry you know jupiter neptune you know, boat rulers of, of Pisces, you know, so then that's a, 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 you know, the quest for redemption of the sun, you know, the sun is really into that, you know, that's like, it's a really positive. And then you have the semi sextile to Pluto and the sextile, you know, that makes the, for the constellation. So then at that point, Pluto becomes the difficult one, right? That's the ancestral rage. That's why Jupiter and Neptune are coming together to the sun to make this transformation, this healing of the ancient mother symbolized by Pluto in the tent. I feel like Pluto is often the tricky one, but maybe that's more of our cultural times than anything else. Oh, Pluto is a very difficult uh, archetype to integrate, most difficult. In most people, it is unconscious. In most right. people, it haunts people. Only if you're willing to do a great deal of work. Uh, we did a, a, a reading with my friend Claudia today, who... Um, who's transiting Pluto is in exact conjunction with moon, with her moon. And so then then that that Pluto moon, you know, it's a very difficult. So 
you want to look at these constellations that we're looking at and you want to look at where they fall in your chart and mm -hmm. then you can kind of understand what's going on. How we've been doing so far? I feel like it's been pretty good. I like the prompt for going into the degrees. Um, there's a lot in this chart. This is going to be interesting. I feel like it's definitely setting the pace for the coming season of winter and it's darkest time i guess another thing to recognize is that this is the darkest day of the year that we're going to experience with this archetype of the chart absolutely it's the darkest day of the year and we've been you know going through the the eclipse season in scorpio and then now we're coming into sagittarius mm -hmm. we're questing for that meaning and I think that all of this is setting the tone for this 2023, you know, the yeah. this work that we're doing. And a lot of us are still processing that Scorpio eclipse. And frankly, we're going to be processing and that Scorpio eclipse will be sensitive with us for the next six months. You know, mm -hmm. that's what an eclipse is. It marks, it sets the tone for the next six months. So this death and rebirth. And so, we're seeing, you know, so many people, you know, passing to the other side, so many challenges in terms of, you know, illness and, and confronting death and confronting mortality, you know, these are really intense. And that triggers the search for meaning, Sagittarius, and then the, the, sol the solstice chart kind of sets the tone for that, you know, so it kind of gives us an understanding of what's ahead for us. Uh, and, and, and I think we have to go back to, to what the meaning of the solstice is, you know, the winter mm -hmm. solstice, the shortest day of the year, the longest night, this is a big shift. You know, we're going, you know, I think we did a, a post for the summer solstice, right and 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 so the the solstice especially the winter solstice i feel is a really great time for retreating into solid practice to look at this rebirth of the light within oneself because sagittarius and capricorn they're the darkest months of the year mm -hmm. and in that darkest time of the year is an opportunity to connect with the light within because the light within is born out of the great darkness. Yeah. And so that's like really, if we can meditate on that, if we can engage with that, if we can have solid practices, and then again, this chart really is helpful in letting us understand what that looks like. I love that. It reminds me of a few things. One of them is the 12 holy nights. Mm -hmm. and how traditionally there's a lot of cultures that would practice these 12 darkest days being a time of really introspective creative practice and slowing things down a lot it's also kind of at odds with our culture which tends to always go like i find in my personal experience of human consciousness so far is that tends to go opposite of what nature's trying to encourage so we tend to busy season christmas buying time and it's funny how it, it's a distraction to the potential of the the magic and medicine that could come through if we allowed and created space for it. Well, in the olden days, it was known as Saturnalia. <laughs> Christmas was Saturnalia, hmm. which was, you know, really engaged with um, this process, you know, because when 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 um, when the sun comes into Capricorn for the next two months, it's going to be ruled by Saturn, mm -hmm. right? So it's a Saturnian season. Yeah. It's a it's a solitary time <laughs> of individual practice of, you know, you know, and so we are afraid in our society of solitary time. Why are we afraid of solitary time? Because we have an unintegrated mood. <laughs> well, that's a good point. That's a good point. That's a good point. But in our society, really, there's seems to be a systematic program to disempowering the the the, the individual in um in 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 facilitating the empowerment of the state. The state yeah. disempowers the individual solitary practice is empowers you to become not easy to control 
If sure. you're a strong individual, you know, won't stand for the controlling bullshit. And that's a lot of what Saturn in Capricorn, but also Saturn in Aquarius. When Saturn in Aquarius has paid the price for really integrating the lessons of Aquarius, then it becomes the change that it wants to see in the world, you know, it becomes, yeah. you know, so the empowerment of Saturn. So then the discipline of Saturn. And again, this is the best time of the year to do that. It's neat. Like when you, when, you, when you're comfortable being alone, in my experience, you tend to be free to create with your, your body through singing or music or artwork or cooking or being in nature and all these ways that can be, I don't know, alone or isolating, but really empowering. And yet now we live in this culture that's, yeah, you're right, like always portraying this element of disempowerment. And and then I think of technology and how we have this like uh, addictive muscle that we're all creating around needing that external, what's this, ex external validation from mm -hmm. putting things online and wanting that and it not being okay unless I get that. and. There is some element that we we do need that external validation, but we put it on a toxic culture validating us versus the great mother or nature validating us. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So the healing so of the of the mothers, that's what I looked at when I saw this chart. And 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 to me, I look at the soul words, you know, soul, mm -hmm. you know, soul is 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 Latin for 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 the for the sun. And so we have the word solitude. Me. solitude is about really becoming our own sun you know mm -hmm. the, the the when the sun is up the, you can't see any other planets yeah only at night can you see the other planets mm -hmm. the sun shines by itself mm -hmm. solitude and you can only uh, you know you can only achieve solace mm -hmm. which is really the process of individuation fully becoming my light that i am through solitude solitude and 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 solace uh anyway that's kind of a meditation in the side it oh. reminds me of soul uh and exactly. soul means student uh, is also used in the term of student of life and then i think of this completion of like the sagittarius energy which is to be the student or the teacher uh it's neat anyways we're having so much fun but we still have one more chart to show <laughs> oh, you guys yeah, okay. so, <laughs> a little bit more thanks for sticking with us if you have any questions or comments please write them below and what you feel about that and how you're feeling this season and if this is helping you out it would be great to hear from you so then we're going to a different constellation there now that's going to be a little more complex so we looked at the constellation of the moon and we looked at the constellation of the soul of sun now we're going to look at Mercury and Venus and Saturn. So Mercury and Venus, for the last three months, they've been playing a dance together and they made three exact conjunctions together. Now, now Mercury is just is right on conjunction with the with the tenth house cusp. So that in itself means a great deal mm -hmm. that Mercury, you know, finding our voice, communicating what it is that we're here to do. But right after on the 23rd, Mercury turns retrograde and then moves towards Venus. And then we're going to get the third conjunction of Mercury and Venus. We had one in October and one in September. And then here's the one in November and so that's an important cycle. Mercury and Venus in conjunction with each other is a creative voice. And now that those two planets are straddling the MC, which is the the uh, the top of the chart. It's the um, what do you call it? Um, hello. Um, North star? the the medium koheli or the middle of mid heaven mid heaven means high noon so you have pluto mercury venus conjunction on the 10th house cusp i call that giving a voice to the ancestral rage 
creatively, you know. So, so, so this practice of redeeming the ancestral rage of healing the mother, it's a Mercury Venus process. It's giving it a voice creatively. And so we've mm -hmm. had those three conjunctions, really important, finding our voice creatively. Now, Mercury and Venus makes a trine to Uranus, and Uranus is right on the ascendant. Time to let your freak flag fly. You know, these are, these are important revolutionary time, despite the collective narrative who tries to constantly bring us back to the consumerism ideal, to the materialistic ideal, to the materialistic narrative. Uranus on the ascendant says enough of that is enough of that, you know? And so then Mercury, Venus, Uranus, and then Mercury, Venus make a semi-sextile to Saturn down to Neptune also. See that? And so, and then back to Mercury, Venus, Pluto. So then that Saturn, Neptune, Pluto, Mercury, and Venus to use our discipline to give a voice to the quest of redemption of the ancestral rage. I love it. And then okay. that Uranus there just being the light bringer. So then we have three major constellations in this chart. We have the moon, Chiron, Mars, giving a voice to the nurturing relationships in our life, looking to become the, the Chiron, you know, the Jupiter Chiron, you know, the, 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 the sage healer, you know. Uh, so many of us are being asked to embody and integrate and become a voice of this shamanic archetype of the wounded healer. <clears throat> and so that's the moon, and then the sun, moon, Jupiter, Neptune, Pluto. That's the second constellation. And then Mercury, Venus, Saturn, Uranus, but also to Neptune, they're kind of complex, you know, so it puts it all together. And again, we talked about Saturn being the ruler of the chart. Oh. Did we flesh that one out pretty good? I think we did, yeah. How do you like this way of, of doing it? So that was a little bit different than what we've been doing, huh? Yeah, it's definitely been a little different. I like it, though. It's um, it's nice to be able to really dive into a chart. And I think it's also nice for you guys to maybe see how Martin reads the chart because it is a little different than any astrologer I've witnessed so far. Um, there's obviously basic similarities, but I love your Jungian approach and how to recognize the myth that's happening within us uh, as a collective group, and then also within the individual. Well, yeah. this is a chart of a moment in time, so it's read as an oracle. Yeah. But you know, the basic tenets of the healer and the dreamer astrology is that the stage is the zodiac. So the zodiac is the stage. So if we look the the analogy of the draw of the theater, the zodiac is the stage. The planets are the actors or the archetypes on the stage, and the angular relationship between them is the dialogue of the play. Hmm. So you can look at where a planet is, and that's really important. But what does it say to the other planets? And if you synthesize that, then you get the story. That story is the myth of the moment. Mm -hmm. So we kind of fleshed it out, and that was really fun. Yeah, good job. I like it. It's fun. So, so let's look at the important dates yeah, uh, that are ahead. Something for you. I recommend pull out your charts right now or reference back to this point if you want to know. Well, you should always have your chart whenever we do our videos. And again, if you have questions or if you want a reading or if you want support and understanding all of this stuff, there's nothing quite, um, you know, quite as helpful as a good astrology reading. Um, 
And um, that's kind of what we do, huh? So uh, reach out. That's why we. That's how we support this channel. Is uh, in our endeavors is through uh, the readings that we get. So don't hesitate to reach out. So the first date of importance, of course, we are at the solstice right now. So that's the twenty second, and then we have Mercury first twenty first. Mercury turns retrograde on December 29th, so that's, that's coming soon. At 24 degrees at, of Capricorn. We'll do a video on that particular cycle. There we have time. We're going to do our next video on uh, the Sagittarius new moon, which is going to be right before that, Christmas. Well, Sagittarius new moon is in two days. So I think you mean the, oh, Gemini, the, the, full the, moon. the Gemini full moon. Sorry, the yeah. Gemini full moon that's coming what right before Christmas, right? The 17th or the 18th. Yeah, in two weeks from now. Yeah, so we'll do that's the next video we'll do. And then we'll do the Mercury retrograde video. And then we looked at the Mercury-Venus conjunction. So this is good. Look at where that Mercury-Venus conjunction fell in your chart, but also look at what you were going through at those times. And then this next conjunction will be the completion of that process. So we have September 27th at 26 degrees of Virgo. We had the first Mercury-Venus conjunction. And it's interesting because Mercury was traveling retrograde at that time as well. Then we had November. Then we had uh, November twenty second, just a little bit ago, and um, that was. Oh no, that's that's wrong. Oh, it was right? uh, it was October twenty second. Okay, sorry, uh, typo. October twenty second at two degrees of Sagittarius. No, it had to be November because that wouldn't have been Sagittarius. Yeah, no, that's a mistake. It wasn't uh, two degrees of Sagittarius. It was um, in in the Scorpio. It was Scorpio. That would make sense. Yeah, it was it was at, in Scorpio on October 22nd, or you can find it. She has a, 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 an ephemeris right now. And then um, we and then on December 30th, we had the third of these um, um, conjunctions coming up. Then we have Mars turned retrograde. So this cycle of Mars is really important as we shift into the new year. Uh, Mercury, uh, Mars turned retrograde at 25 degrees Gemini on October 30th. Then it turns direct on January 11th at eight degrees of Gemini. And so that's going to be an important shift of energy. Then we talked about Saturn entering into Pisces on March 8th. We also have Pluto entering into Aries. Aries. And, well, oh. uh, Pluto enters. We made some, some mistakes there. Pluto enters, enters into Pisces. Aquarius <laughs> is what's meant to be there. Pluto goes into Aquarius. <laughs> <laughs> typos uh, we are not perfect uh, but we are human and we're glad that you're tolerating with us i, I think that's really important that our uh, audience is very kind to all the mistakes that we make uh, we are humans and we don't do any editing um <laughs> uh, jupiter conjunct chiron on march 11th that's going to be a very big time and it's about that healing process that we're all going through so these are the important dates uh, we've given you a lot of information today you're going to be able to to um to review that um amply if you have any questions or anything my email is spirit of the time one times 108 at gmail.com and then day by day healing at gmail.com um these are not easy times uh, we know that and i wanted to maybe leave everybody with this uh this kind of an analogy you know we talked about this saturn uranus square and we've been going through two years of it, and we're at the end of the fourth exact square. So planetary alignments work like waves. Mm. You start feeling them a long time before they come. Then they, then they start being visible. 
And then they build and they build and they build. And at the end, they break. And then that wave is felt long after. So it's not that that Saturn Uranus square is done with and we're not going to talk about it. In my sense, you know, people were talking about 2023 and how 2023 is going to be more difficult than 2022 and 2021 and 2020. And, and, and what I told them is, is that really it's not so much that 2023 is going to be more difficult than those two, the, those three years that we just went through is that in 2023, we're going to realize how bad 2020, 2021 and 2023, uh, 2022 were. Mm. And that's really, you know, is that we're really in the aftermath, you know, the wave has broken and then this Saturn coming into Pisces and this Pluto coming into Aquarius and this Jupiter Chiron conjunction, those will set the tone for the rest of the year. And we'll look at that when we look at the spring equinox chart. Yeah. I think I'm going to do a video, um, a, a playlist on just these, you know, and make it a regular basis that we do the chart for the solstices and the equinox smart okay. this was a really fun Great. chart dude we got into it yeah thanks so much for staying and if you're still here now you're a real good uh followers of yeah. ours so we're very very grateful please subscribe pass mm -hmm. this on be safe and settle into a good spiritual practice over this over this solstice um thank you diana Thank you, Martin. Thank you for your listening, doing the work as you can, and good luck in your process and your practice. Whoop, whoop, whoop. MC Starman is in the house.